Live from Las Vegas, it's The Cube, covering HPE Discover 2017. Brought to you by Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Okay, hey, welcome back everyone. We're here live in Las Vegas for our exclusive three-day coverage from theCUBE, SiliconANGLE Media's flagship program. We go out to events and we extract the signal noise, talk to the, the smartest people we can find, CEOs, entrepreneurs, R&D lab managers, and of course, we're here at HPE Discover 2017. Our next two guests, Andrew Wheeler, fellow VP, Deputy Director, Hewlett Packard Labs, and Kirk Bresnicker, fellow and VP, Chief Architect of HP Labs, was on yesterday. Welcome back, welcome to theCUBE. You look like labs, well known, you guys are doing great research. Uh, Meg Whitman, really staying with the focused message and one of the comments she mentioned at our press analyst uh, meeting yesterday was focusing on the labs. So I want to ask you, where's the range in the labs and what you got in terms of what you guys, when, when does something go outside the lines, if you will? Yeah, good question. So uh, if you think about um, Hewlett Packard Labs and really our charter or role within the company, we're really kind of tasked for looking at things that will disrupt our current business or look for kind of those new opportunities. So for us, we, we have something we call a, an innovation horizon. And you know, it, it's like any other por portfolio that you have where you've got maybe things that are more you know, kind of near term, maybe you know, one to three years out, things that are easily kind of transferred or the timing is right. And then we have kind of another bucket that says, well, maybe it's more of a three to five year uh, kind of in that advanced development category where it needs a little more incubation, um, but you know, it needs a little more time. And then you know, we reserve probably you know, a smaller pocket that's for more kind of pure research, things that are further out, higher risk, it's a bigger bet, uh, but you know, we do want to have kind of a complete portfolio of those. And you know, over time throughout our history, you know, we've got really success stories in all of those. So it's, yeah. it's always finding kind of that right blend. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, there's clearly a focus around the advanced development piece now that we've had a lot of things come from that research point and uh, really one of the... So you're, looking, of, you're yeah. looking for breakthroughs. I mean, that's what you're, some incremental clearly. improvement, simplify IT, all that good stuff. But you guys still have your eyes on some breakthroughs. That's right, breakthroughs, how do we differentiate what we're doing? So, uh, but yeah, clearly, clearly looking for those breakthrough opportunities. And one of the things that's come up really big in this show um, is the security and chip thing was pretty hot, very hot, and the, actually Wikibon's public, true public cloud report that they put out, sizing up on-prem, the cloud market, true which is private cloud. true private cloud, I'm sorry. Yep. Um, and that's not including hybrids, a $265 billion TAM. But the notable thing that I want to get your thoughts on is the point Dave pushed, pushed was over 10 years, $150 billion is going to shift out of IT on premise into other differentiated services. Out of mean, labor, out, out of, of IT labor. Out of, out yeah. of labor. So this, and I asked him what that means, as the analyst, he said, that means it's going to shift to vendor R&D, meaning the suppliers have to do more work so that the customers don't have to do the R&D, which we see a lot in cloud where there's a lot of R&D going on. That's your job. So you guys are HP Labs. What's happening in that R&D area that's going to offload that labor so they can move to some other high yield tasks? Sure. Take hey, first. Sure. Go ahead, take a you know, stab at it. Um, you know, when we've been looking at some of the concepts we had in the, the memory driven computing uh, research and advanced development program, the machine program, you know, one of the things that was was the kickoff for me back in 2003. Um, we looked at what we had in the Unix market. Uh, we had advanced virtualization technologies. We had great um, management of resource technologies. We had memory fabric technologies, but they're all kind of proprietary. But still it got us thinking, and back then we were saying, how does RISC Unix compete with industry standard service? This new methodology, new wave, exciting, changing cost structures, and, and for us it was, a, it was a chance to explore those ideas and understand how they would affect um, our maintaining the kind of rich set of customer experiences, mission criticality, security, all of these elements, and it's kind of funny that we're sort of coming back to the future again, and we're saying, okay, we have this move, we want to see these things happen on the cloud, and we're seeing those same technologies, the composable infrastructure we have in Synergy, and looking forward to seeing the research we've done on the machine advanced development program, and how will that intersect hardware composability, converged infrastructure, so that you can actually have that shift, those technologies coming in, taking on more of that burden to allow you freedom of choice, so you can make sure that you end up with that right mix. 
the right part on a, on a full public cloud, the right mix on a full private cloud, the right mix on that intelligent edge, but still having the ability to have all of those great software development methodologies, that agile methodology, the only thing the kids know how to do out of school is open source and agile now. So you want to make sure that you can embrace that and make sure regardless of where the right spot is for a particular application in your entire enterprise portfolio, that you have this common set of experiences and tools. And some of the research and development we're doing will enable us to drive that into that existing conventional uh, enterprise market, as well as this intelligent edge, making a continuum, a continuum from the core to the intelligent edge, and something that modern computer science graduates will find completely comfortable. And the one attracting them is going to be the key. I think the edge is kind of intoxicating if you think about all the possibilities that are out there in terms of what, you know, just from a business model disruption, also technology. I mean, wearables are edge, uh, brain implants in the future will be edge. Mm -hmm. You know, the singularities here, as Ray Kurzweil would yeah. say. I mean, but this is the truth. This is what's happened. This is real right now. Oh, absolutely. You know, we, we think of all that data, and, and right now, we're just scratching the surface. I remember it was, it was 1994, the first time I fired up a, a web server inside of my development team. So I could begin sending out design information on prototype products inside of HP, um, and it was a novelty. People were like, what is that thing you just sent me an email, <laughs> WW whatever? And, yeah. and suddenly we went from, like almost overnight, from a novelty to a business necessity to then it transformed the way that we created applications for the A lot of people don't know this, but you, since you brought it up, this historical trivia, HP uh, Labs, Silicon Valley Labs had um, scientists who actually invented the web with Tim Berners-Lee. I think HTML founder was an HP Labs uh, scientist. Uh, it's pretty notable trivia, a lot of people mm -hmm. don't know that, so congratulations. And so when I look at just what you're saying there, and then we see this new edge thing, is it's going to be similarly transformative. Now today, it's a little gimmicky perhaps, it's sort of stretching the surface, it's taking security, and it's, it can be problematic at times, but that will transform, because there is so much possibility for economic transformation. Right now, almost all of that data on the edge gets thrown away. If you, the first person who understands, okay, I'm going to get 1% more of that data and turn it into real time intelligence, real time action, that will unmake industries yeah. and it will remake new industries. Andrew, this is the applied research vision. You got to apply R&D to a problem. Correct. And that's what he's getting at, but you also got to think differently. You got to bring in talent, the young guns. How are you guys bringing in the young guns? What's the, <laughs> what's the honey pot? Well, I think you know. For us, it's uh, the 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 sell for us. Obviously, is uh, you know just the tradition of, of Hewlett Packard to begin with, right? So it, it you know we we have uh, you know recognition at that level, uh, even at and it's not just Hewlett Packard Labs as well. It's you know just R and D in general, right? Kind of it, you know, the DNA being an engineering company. So, uh, but it's uh, you know I think it is it it is creating kind of these opportunities. And whether it's internship programs, uh, you know, just the various things that we're doing, whether it's enterprise-related, high-performance computing, I think this edge opportunity is is a really interesting one, is a bridge because if you think about all the things that we hear about in the enterprise in terms of, oh, you know, I need uh, this deep analytics capability, or uh, you know, even a lot of the in-memory things that we're talking about, real-time response, uh, driving information, right? All of that needs to happen at the edge as well for various opportunities. So uh, it's got a lot of the young graduates excited. We host, you know, hundreds of interns every year, and it's it's really exciting to see kind of the ideas they come in with, and uh, you know, they're all excited to work in this space. So Kirk, you have your machine button on got the, it. You got three, three. You got, you got the, of course, you got the the logo, and then you got the machine. I got the, the yeah the labs logo. The labs. I got, got the it. machine logo. So let's, let's, when I first entered, you talked about in the early 1980s, when I first got in the business, I remember Gene Amdahl, the best I.O. is no I.O. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We're here again with this sort of memory semantics uh, centric computing. So in terms of the, the three that Andrew laid out, the three types of sort of projects you guys pursue, where does the machine fit? Is it sort of in all three, or maybe you could talk about that a little bit? I, I, I think it is. So we, we see those, those technologies that uh, over the last three years we have 
brought so much new, and it was the critical thing about this is, I think it's also sort of the prototyping of the overall approach, our lean-in approach here, is that right. it wasn't just researchers, right? Those 500 people who made that 160 terabyte monster machine possible weren't just from labs. It was engineering teams from across Hewlett Packard Enterprise. It was our supply chain team. It was our services team telling us how these things fit together for real. Now, we've had incredible technology experiences, incredible technologist experiences, and what we're seeing is that we have intercepts on conventional platforms, whether it's the photonics, the persistent memories. Those will make our existing DCIG and SDCG products better almost immediately. Uh, but then we also have you know, these whole cloth applications, and as we take all of our learnings, drive them into open source software, drive them into the Gen Z consortium, and we'll see you know, probably 18, 24 months from now, some of those first optimized silicon designs pop out of that ecosystem, then we'll be right there to assemble those again into conventional systems as well as more, more expansive exascale computing, intelligent edge with large persistent memories and application specific processing as that next generation of gateways. I think we can see these intercept points at every category Andrew talked about. Well, and another good point there that kind of uh, magnifies the model we were talking about, had, you know, if we were sitting here five years ago, we would be talking about things like photonics and non-volatile memory as being those big R projects, mm -hmm. right? Those higher risk, longer term things. But right, as those mature, we make more progress, innovation happens. Right, it gets pulled into yeah. that shorter time frame that becomes advanced And Meg has talked about that, wanting yeah. to, to get more productivity out of, out of the labs, uh, and she's also pointed out you guys have spent more on R&D in the last several years, but even as we talked about the other day, you want to see a little bit more D and keep the R going. <clears throat> yep. So my question is, when you get to that point of being able to support DCIG, or where do you, is it a handoff, are you guys intimately involved, when you're making decisions about, okay, so Memristor, for example, okay, this is great, that's still in the R phase, then you bring it in, but now we got to commercialize this and you right. got 3D NAND coming out and okay, let's use that, that fits into our framework. So how much do you guys get involved in that handoff, you know, the commercialization of this stuff? It's very, we get very involved. So it, it's at the point where uh, when we think we have something that, hey, we think you know, maybe this could, could get into a product or let's, let's see if there's a good intercept here, uh, we work jointly at that at that point, right? It's it's lab engineers, it's it's the product managers out of the group, engineers out of the business group. They essentially work collectively then on getting it to that next step. So it's it's kind of just one big R and D effort at that point. And so specifically as it relates to the to the machine, um, where do you see in the next you know the near term? Let's let's call near term next three three years or five years even. Um, what do you see that looking like? Is it is it this combination of you know, memory with capacitors or, or you know, flash extensions? What does that look like in terms of commercial terms that we can expect? So I really think uh, the, the palette is pretty broad here, that I can see these going into existing, um, existing rack and tower products to allow them to have memory that's composable down and compute that's composable down to the individual, individual module level, to be able to, to take that, that facility to have just the right resources applied at just the right time with that API that we have in one view, extend down to composing the hardware itself. I think we look at those edge line systems and want to have just the right kind of analytic capability, large persistent memories at that edge so we can handle those zettabytes and zettabytes of data in full fidelity, analyzed at the edge, sending back that intelligence to the core, but also taking action at the edge in a time frame that matters. Uh, I also see it coming out and being the basis of our exascale high performance computing. You know, when you want to have a, a exascale system that has all of the combined capacity of the top 500 systems today, but one twentieth of their power, that is going to take rather novel technologies. And everything we've been working on is exactly what's feeding that research and soon to be advanced development and then soon to be production uh, in supply chain. Great. So the question I have is, obviously we saw some really awesome Gen 10 stuff here at this show. You guys are seeing that, obviously you're on stage talking about a lot of the cool R&D, but really the reality is that's multiple years in the works with some of this root of trust silicon mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, technology that's pretty getting the show buzzed up. Everyone, everyone's psyched about it. DreamWorks Animation's talking about how simplicity than M&A and, and inorganic 
uh, opportunities to help in our business, and they got the security with the Root of Trust, NIST certified and compliant, mm -hmm. pretty impressive. What's next? What else are you working on? Because this is where the R&D is on your shoulders for that next level of innovation. Where, where do you guys see that? Because security is a huge deal. Yep, I mean, is. that's that great example of how you guys innovated and bring, because that'll stop the, the vector of attacks in the surface area of IoT. If you can get the servers to lock down and you have firmware that's secure, it makes a lot of sense. Right. That's probably the tip of the iceberg. What, what else is happening with security? So when we think about security and, and our efforts on advanced development research around the machine, what you're seeing here with the Proliance is making the machines more secure, the, in, the inherent platform more secure. But the other thing I would point to is, is the application we're running on the prototype, large scale graph inference. And this is security because you have a, a platform like the machine, able to digest hundreds and hundreds of terabytes worth of log data to look for that, that fingerprint, that subtle clue that you have a system that has been compromised. And these are not blatant, let's just blast everything out to some dot dot xxx subdomain. Uh, this is an advanced persistent threat by a very capable adversary who is very subtle in their reach out from a system that has been compromised to that command and control server. Mm -hmm. The signs are there if you can look at the data holistically. If you yep. can look at that DNS log graph, a billion entries every day, constantly changing. If you can look at that as a graph in totality in a time frame that matters, then that's, that's a very empowering thing for our cyber defense team. And I think that's one of the interesting things that we're adding to this discussion. Not only protect, detect, and recover, but giving offensive weapons to our cyber defense team so they can hunt. They can hunt for those advanced persistent threats. One of the things, Andrew, I'll get your thoughts on the reaction to this because I'll make an observation, you guys can comment and tell me I'm, I'm all wet, fell off, fell off the deep end or whatnot. Last year, HP had great marketing around the machine. I love that Star Trek ad, it was beautiful. Oh, yeah. and it was just, and machine is very, um, a great marketing technique. I mean, you use the machine, it, so it, a lot of people were set expectations on the machine. So you saw uh, articles being written, maybe people didn't understand it. A little bit pulled back, almost dampered down a little bit in terms of the marketing of the machine other than the pin. Is that because you don't yet know what it's going to look like, or there's so many broader possibilities, or you're trying to set expectations? Because the machine certainly has a lot of range, and you're almost, it's almost as if, if I could read your mind, you don't want to post the position too early on what it could do, and that's my observation. Why, uh, why the pullback? I mean, certainly as a marketer, I'd be, I'd be all over that. Yeah, and I think part of it has been, in, has been intentional just on um, how the ecosystem, we need the ecosystem to develop kind of around this at the same time, meaning uh, there are a lot of kind of moving parts to it, whether it's around the open source community and kind of getting their head wrapped around what does this new architecture look like. We've got things like, uh, you know, the Gen Z consortium where we're pouring a lot of our understanding and knowledge into that. And so we need a lot of partners. We know we're in the day and an age where look, there's no single one company that's going to do every piece and part themselves. So part of it is kind of enough to get out there, to get the buzz, get the excitement, to get other people then on board. And now we we have been heads down, especially this last six <laughs> months, of jamming you know, hard on uh, it. Yeah. getting it all together. Yeah. Uh, you know, you think about what you know what we showed. You know, first essentially first booted the thing yeah. in November, and now you know we've got it running at this scale. That's really been the focus, but we needed a lot of that early engagement yeah. interaction to get a lot of, uh, a lot of the other eco members of the ecosystem yeah. kind of on board and starting to contribute. And really that's where we're at today. Yeah, it's almost you want to let it take its own course organically mm -hmm. because you mentioned just on the cyber surveillance opportunity around the crunching. Exactly. You kind of don't know yet what the killer app is, right? And that's the great thing of where we're at today <laughs> now that we have kind of the prototype running at scale like this it is allowing us to move beyond, look, we've had the simulators to work with, we've had kind of emulation vehicles. Now you've got the real thing mm -hmm. to run actual workloads on. You, you know, we had the announcement around DZ&E as kind of an yeah. early, early example, but it really now will allow us to do some refinement that allows us to get to those product concepts. I wonder if I can just ask yeah. a closing question. So I've had this screen here, it's like the theater, and I've been seeing these you know, these great things coming up. And one was Moore's Law is Dead. Come <laughs> and learn about it. Oh, that another, was my session this another, morning. Another one was blockchain. I, and unfortunately, I couldn't hear it, but I okay. could see the, the tease. So, when you guys come to work in the morning, what's kind of the driving set of assumptions for you? Is it just that technology is limitless and we're going to go, you know, figure it out? Uh, or are there things that sort of frame 
your raison d'etre, when you that you that drive your your activities and thinking. And what what are the fundamental assumptions that you guys use to to drive your actions? So one of the, what's been driving me for the last couple of years is this exponential growth of information that we create as a species. That seems to have no upper bounding function that damps it down. At the same time, the time frame we want to get from information, from raw information to insight that we can take action on, seems to be shrinking from days, weeks, minutes. Now it's down to microseconds. If I want to have an intelligent power grid, uh, intelligent uh, 3G communication, I have to have microseconds. So you look at those two things, and at the same time, we just have to be the lucky few who are sitting in these seats right when Moore's Law is slowing down and will eventually flatten out. And so all the skills that we've had over the last 20, 28 years of my career, um, you look at those technologies and you say, those aren't the ones that are going to take us forward. This is an opportunity for us to really look at, examine every piece of this, because if it was something we could have just, can't we just dot, 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 do one thing? We would do it, right? We can't just do one thing. We have to be more holistic if we're going to create the next 20, 30, 40 years of innovation. And that's really what I'm looking at. How do we get back exponential scaling on supply to meet this unending exponential demand. So technically, I would imagine, that's a very hard thing to balance because the, f the, the, the former uh, says that we're going to have more data than we've ever seen. The latter says we've got to act on it fast, which is a great trend for memory, but the economics are going to be such a challenge to meet yep. and yep. balance that. We have to be able to afford the energy and we have to be able to afford the material costs, and we have to afford the business processes that do all these things. So, yeah, you need breakthroughs, yeah. and that's really what we've been doing. And I think that's why we're so fortunate uh, at Hewlett Packard Enterprise to have the labs team, but also that world-class engineering and that world-class supply chain and a services team that can get us introduced to every interesting customer around the world who has those challenging problems and can give us that partnership and that insight to get those kind of breakthroughs. And I wonder if there'll be a tipping point, if the tipping point will be, and I'm sure you've thought about this, a change in the application development model that drives so much value and so much productivity that it offsets some of the you know, potential cost issues of, of changing the development paradigm. And I think you're seeing hints yeah. of that. No, we saw this, we saw this when we went from systems of record OLTP systems to systems of engagement, mobile systems, and suddenly new ways to develop it. I think now the interesting thing is we move over to systems of action and we're moving from programmatic right. to training. And this is this, this interesting thing. If you have those zettabytes of data, you can't have a pair of human eyeballs in front of that. You have to have a machine learning algorithm. That's the only thing that's voracious enough to consume yeah. this data in a timely enough fashion to get us answers but you can't program it. We saw those old approaches in the old school AI, and old school autonomous <laughs> vehicle programs, they go about 10 feet, boom, and they flip over, right? Yeah. Now, you know, they're on our streets and they are functioning. They're a little bit raw right now, but that improvement cycle is fantastic because yeah. they're training, they're not programming. Right. It's a great opportunity for the breakthrough to your point about Moore's Law, but also all this new functionality that has yet to be defined is right on the doorstep. Uh, Andrew Kirk, thanks so much for sharing Thank the great guys. insight. Love Hewlett Packard Labs. Love the R&D conversation. You know, it gets us a chance to kind of co-play in the wild and, and, and dream about the future. You guys are out creating it. Congratulations, and thanks for spending the time on theCUBE. Appreciate it. Great. Hey, thanks. CUBE coverage will continue here live at Las Vegas for HPE Discover 2017 Hewlett Packard Enterprises annual event. We'll be right back with more. Stay with us.